Thank you very much. I'm very uh, grateful that Javed Akhtar Sahib is here to release this book. Um, I have no idea what he will say. Um, and I'm sure that what he says uh, uh, will be very edifying. But Barkha Dutt uh, agreeing to, to have a little chat with me about, about this book is what will, what will follow. Um, I'm to introduce the book only to say this to you that uh, it surprises me that so many people are present here um, in, in this, uh, at this venue um, to understand or perhaps to, uh, to hear about uh, those five years in which uh, we were in government. We were in government for 10 years, but five years in which I shared responsibilities in, in the government, UPA2, um, which made us, as it appears from the last elections, extremely unpopular in this country. <laughs> and uh, something that I personally discovered myself in my own elections. Uh, but uh, whether that was just a passing phase, uh, whether, whether that was uh, just, uh, uh, just a flash in the pan, etc., uh, is something we will discover over a period. But it is an honest attempt to say to people that we were not as bad as some people might have made, made us out to be. That there were serious problems in this country that we tried to solve to the best of our ability, perhaps not always successfully, and nobody can be successful in everything that they try to do to solve in this country, but there are lessons to be learned, both for us as indeed for those who succeeded us in government and those who hope to succeed them in government in future. So this is a, an honest attempt to tell you what we saw from the inside. Why do I call it the other side of the mountain? It's because uh, we were on the top of the mountain. We were seen as a very successful party in UPA1. You gave us a tremendous, tremendous support. We came back in, in UPA2 and they were, we were at the pinnacle. We were at the top of the mountain. And what you saw was the slide as we slid down. But what you didn't see was on the other side of the mountain. And I have, because of the position of advantage that we, some of us were in, we could see both sides of the mountain. I've just tried to tell you a little bit on what lies on the other side. It may be frightening, it may be interesting, it may be titillating, it may be enjoyable, um, it may well be boring. But that's for you to judge. Thank you very much. Um, Javed Saab and Salman, uh, let's first release the book. Thank you. Javed a few words, please. Exactly a few words. <laughs> <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, I was just thinking that brain is really a unique organ of human body. It starts working before one is born and it keeps working relentlessly even when you are sleeping. Your brain is working. But then it suddenly stops when you are releasing a book that you have not read. So I'm afraid I won't be able to speak about the book, but I know the topic. And uh, this is uh, rather unusual. You know, such books are written either by the journalists or the people who have now created a distance from the situation, from the politics, whether by choice or by the passing time. But here we have an active politician who is very much active and a part of a political party and that system that he is writing about, he has written about, it is delicate, it is difficult, that's for sure. And uh, how much he has succeeded in creating that balance, that one can only decide after reading the book. But I am quite convinced because I may not have read the book, I don't know much about the book but I know about the writer. I am convinced that we are, will read a good book. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that there is 
a virtue that has become almost obsolete. If you have it in you or in your work or in anything about you, then you are not happening, you are not cool. And that obsolete virtue is dignity and decency. Because if you are aggressive, if you are borderline rude, and sometimes you cross the border, then you are cool. Then you are, you have an edge. There are so many words for misbehavior. So, so, I mean, maybe you may call me old-fashioned in this matter, but I suppose dignity gives you, shows certain self-confidence of the person, and he or she offers you a second look. So I'm sure that a dignified and a decent person like him, when he'll write that dignity and decency and this allowance of the second look of his political career and of his peers and colleagues will be there. So hopefully we have a nice book at our disposal at the moment and my best wishes. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Javed sir. <laughs> so Salman, I think uh, Javed Saab gave us the perfect cue to actually begin our conversation. We'll just wait for him to quickly sit. Javed Saab, sit down and start. So one of the things he said in his opening remarks was that it was highly unusual for an active politician to be writing about a party that he's still associated with. In other words, why should one believe that you are able to be objective about your own party. Do you claim to write this book with some dispassionate distance? Or do you write it as if effectively a propagandist for the Congress party? Well, I, um, uh, yeah, I, I accept that as a legitimate question. Um, uh, not only have I not uh, taken a decision to uh, quit politics, um, mm -hmm. but uh, as I hope you will understand my party hasn't taken a decision to fold itself up. So we are both, uh, we are both going to be around for some time, hopefully. Mm. Um, but there is a question, obviously, about objectivity. And I think that's, that's what the readers will have to judge. Is it just a party pamphlet uh, saying that uh, we are the greatest and that uh, whatever has been done to us is, is unfair? Um, or is this really an honest attempt to tell you that there is a serious point of view in the Congress party. It may not have been accepted by, by the people. There have, may have been misrepresentations. There may have been um, lack of, of appropriate judgment that we hoped we would get. Uh, but it's an honest attempt. But certainly, it will not follow a script that uh, some of your colleagues in the media might have expected me to do, was to, uh, in the first three chapters, tell you how to make a noose and then put it around my neck and say, can you just pull the, pull the rope a little so that I can drop dead quickly? Now, certainly it's not a book of that kind. Um, but, you know, I, I must tell you that when the book was first reported as being released in the media, a lot of things were reported in the media which sounded that I was, I was really unhappy with my party, uh, which was completely, completely untrue. And I think if you read the book, you will find that uh, I'm proud of the party I belong to. But I do think that in a modern democratic party, there must be open discussion. Uh, we must see where we've gone wrong and we must be able to correct it, particularly by inputs that are provided at gatherings like this. Do you accept to begin with, because that is what comes across in the book, that while your party is not planning to fold itself up, it is in the midst of an existential crisis. Well, um, yeah, in a sense, this existen existential term or word is, is a little bit of a little thing that can be misleading. Every party that goes through defeats uh, at any point of time, anywhere in the world, 
has to relook at some of its programs, some of its structures, some of its pat leadership patterns, etc., and then present, present as it were, a new, a new look party to the to the world, to the country, um, and that's what we are in the process of doing, and we will do it. Um, to assume that the fact that you've lost an election means it's an issue of an exist existential nature, I, I think is, is a misunderstanding of the democratic process. Let me put it to you like this. The impression uh, that comes across to political observers such as myself is that the Congress does not have a strategy to counter Narendra Modi except to wait for him and his government to make a mistake. It's, it's, it's almost like you don't have a counter narrative, so you're counting on him and his government to stumble rather than having a narrative of your own that offers an alternative prescription for today's India. Um, Mr. Javed Akhtar has disassociated himself from this discussion, but yesterday when we traveled together, he said something very interesting, um, perhaps a little tongue-in-cheek, but he said the worst thing a person can do is to try and emulate himself or herself. Um, and I think this is, uh, as far as we are concerned, this is what is happening with Mr. Modi. That the worst thing Mr. Modi can do is to emulate himself or his impression of what mm. Mr. Modi is. Um, and uh, it's the self-emulation that can become a problem. But that doesn't mean that we as a party have to wait for somebody to make mistakes and therefore hope that if they make enough mistakes, we will be back to power. Mm. Our party whether we are in power or we are out of power, have to be a credible, credible program and a credible ideology that we present to the people of our country. This whole point of are we beyond ideology yeah. is a question that, that we were faced with. But I think that in recent terms, particularly with the, with the uh, positions that the present government has taken, there is an attempt to revive an ideology, whatever, whatever one might think about it, but there's an attempt to revive an ideology, and I think a counter ideology, if you like, if you like, an alternative ideology will also be sought in this country. And I think that's what, that is, that is really our opportunity. Now, there, there will be questions as we go along about that ideology, whether it comes across as authentic uh, to people today. But isn't the really frightening thing for the party that even when people are angry with the BJP, such as in, or, or, or want an option to the BJP, such as in Bihar or in Delhi, their alternative is not the Congress, but some other party. Now, I want to read out to you what you write yourself. So you can't, in fact, dismiss this as my opinion. You've been candid enough to talk about the Aam Aadmi Party as being the latest among the challengers. And you say this party may not have longevity, given that it has come into existence as a reaction to ambient conditions, but yet it might last long enough to destroy us. The Aam Aadmi Party might last long enough to destroy us. That's a pretty strong statement to make and an honest statement to make. Well, I mean, uh, therefore, at least you will concede that the book is a candid, honest yeah. opinion about the circumstances in which we find ourselves. And unless we do that, I don't think that there would be a release for us from the conditions in which we find ourselves. Yeah. Now, I think what happened in the Delhi elections, the second round of elections in Delhi, where we got zero seats, BJP got three seats, and uh, 67 seats out of 70 went, uh, went to Aam Aadmi Party, is a historic, is a his historic uh, election result. And I think we can't just uh, turn a blind eye to it. But given that there is, there is uh, an attempt to find other alternatives, we just have to work that much harder. Now, nobody, nobody can predict that a party in a particular form will survive for another 100 years, whether it's our party or the BJP or the Aam Aadmi Party or any other party for that matter. But I think that other than understanding our shortcomings, we also have to understand the demographic changes and political changes that are happening in the, world, in the, in the country. And therefore, the fact that there is fragmentation of politics towards local, local choices, uh, parties, local, local issues, and, and local aspirations is something that we have to, we have to factor in, in whatever program we, f we actually so, present. So, for the so whole do country. you believe that the Aam Aadmi Party has the potential, as you indicate, to destroy the Congress? That in many ways it's seeking to occupy, along with other parties, like let's say Nitish's uh, Janta Dal United, uh, an, 
a space in the national imagination that when people here say, okay, if not Mr. Modi, who? The problem for the Congress is nobody says Rahul Gandhi when they fill in that blank. I mean, am I right? And this is a yeah. problem. I see, mean, raise your I, hand uh, if you agree with me. Yeah, it's, see, this is, uh, uh, I think these are, these are transitory opinions that you form. Uh, there are a lot of people. Okay, let him speak no, now. No, 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 no booing is I'm necessary. I'm sorry, the yeah. mis mistake yeah. that you made by saying no is as though you're saying you made a permanent opinion. Nobody yeah. can have permanent opinions. Sure. And if you have permanent opinions for the future and you bind yourself for the future, then I'm sorry you're not being very intelligent. You have to have transitory opinions. They may be transitory that last for a hundred years, but you have to in a democracy, in real life, you have to change opinions as you go along. We'll have to change, you'll have to change. The issue is not today, there's no election today. It's not between X and Y. Right. The issue is whether we offer you something credible in the times to come. Now, we are not stupid. We will not come back to you with, an, with a lack of a credible, credible ideology and a credible program and a credible face and a credible, credible leader. But when the time comes, that will be there. Right now, it's a time of conversation. We have to learn from you whatever you have done, whatever you want to do, and whatever you are likely to do is something must influence our thoughts as we prepare to prepare to present those thoughts to you. I don't think that we should block off anything. I'm not particularly discouraged by your saying no today. I mean, you, ha you have to be aware of it. The results no, reflected I, that sentiment. It's there. It's there. I mean, whatever, what, whatever, whatever you've got a result from these people, I could ask a question on which... No, Most no, I, I, I mean the 2014 no, no, result so the 14 reflected result. that this sentiment absolutely, is real. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And we respect the 2014 yeah. result. If we didn't respect it, I wouldn't write the book. I wouldn't write the book. I have written the book because we must have a conversation. And that conversation can't have conditions. It is a, con it is a conversation that must be an honest conversation on both sides. We need you as much as you need us in a democracy, and which doesn't mean that you need only the Congress, you need everybody who presents themselves in a democracy, and therefore the conversation must continue. All that we are saying now is, we have not done anything, we have not done anything that entitles you to say no conversation. Okay. It's happened in India in the past when people have said no conversation, but conversations have happened, and then India has changed. It happened with Indira Gandhi, it happened with other people, it happened with Atal Bihari Bachpay. It can happen again, but the conversation must continue. I think it's fair to say that what you're actually saying is there's nothing permanent about politics, and we've all seen enough to know that, and that's fair. But you have a second chapter called Media Monsters. Media Monsters, there's a single quote around monsters to make it a little polite. Do I look like a monster to you? Well, um, I would. Uh, it'd be, it'd be <laughs> it's lacking okay. in, you can answer honestly. It'll be lacking in chivalry. <laughs> no, no. Um, no. The, uh, the, uh, if I was to say that, if I was to say that, and uh, and as you said, and as Javed Saab said, I'm still in public life. I still have to appear on media channels. You will still be at the other end. And my God, if I said you were a monster, I can imagine what would happen to me when I come onto your channel. So, no, no, no. I'm not going to say that. But the people that I've said are monsters yes. may be people on whose channels I will not go. Oh, and, uh, uh, and there may be a good reason not to go into those channels. Well, that is uh, one conversation I'm happy to take part in. But more seriously, Salman, what th the argument that you actually make and what came across to me after reading the book is you see the Congress as a victim of media bias. Now, why I find this a rather extraordinary uh, sort of argument is because I know that it's the BJP that constantly tells us that we are, the English media in particular is biased against Narendra Modi. We hear this all the time. Yet your argument in this book is exactly the opposite. You're actually saying the media was biased right through the campaign of 2014. On what basis do you draw that conclusion? Well, I mean, on, see, the, the very fact that today media, perhaps the English media is being told that you are biased against Mr. Modi, the Prime Minister, the very fact that you're being told that today means that there was something different in 2014. Why didn't Mr. Modi go into a campaign saying the English media is biased against me? He didn't say that. 
He was very happy with the English media. He was very happy with the entire media. Why is he saying today that they are biased? I'm, I, I, I no, will admit. No, he said they were biased in, after 2002 as well. I mean, he's no, no, said that were, about me, certainly. Said in 2002, he said they were biased. 2014, he didn't say they remain biased. And now why is, why is he saying that they are biased again? Because there is an issue in our country about how media is managed. There is an issue in our country about how we perceive media and how media perceives us. Now, we know what is going on in the media today. And that doesn't mean that we should write off the media. You are an integral part of the democratic process. Whether we like you or we don't like you, you are a democratic, you are a bastion of democracy in our country. Mm. And therefore, as I said, our conversation, if it is to continue with the masses, with young people, with middle class people, with families, our conversation with the media must also continue. But the media must be fair. Media must be fair to only reproduce what we are saying. Media need not be, need not come to the same conclusion that we wanted to come to. And I believe that the media's role should be to inform rather than to be judgmental and to pronounce judgment. What the media was doing to us was pronouncing judgment. Before we got to court, they had already said that we were guilty. Mm. Now, I think that is destroying the system. You can destroy Congress party leaders, but don't destroy the system by imposing guilt on persons before they're even put on trial. You, you know, the media trial is the subject of a, diff of, a, of a longer conversation, but I would put it to you that more journalists in my fraternity have been uh, accused of being anti-BJP, then we've been accused of being anti-Congress. In fact, the one label that's foisted on us, even though we don't want it, is you're soft on the Congress. It, we hear it all the time on social media, off social media. So it's really ironic that you should say this. And when you object to judgmentalism, we have been as judgmental about Dadri. We've been as judgmental about Hyderabad. Wrong is wrong. Why blame the media for your See, government's shortcomings? A, I think there is a, there's a critical difference between somebody being lynched to death and somebody taking a decision that someone finds false with. The 2G decision yes. that some people find, find, found fault with. The 2G decision hasn't concluded with a conviction yet. It's still being tried. But all the licenses were cancelled, which no, no. means that the Supreme Court found that there was enough uh, uh, prima facie in it that was objectionable. And it certainly See, reeked okay. of crony capitalism. And that's what, that's what, that's what I have said. Every day, every day, there are courts taking decisions that something that the government has done is wrong and reversing it. You were almost prevented from holding this gathering here because the court felt that you had been given permission, permission without adequate precautions being taken for safety of people who are, who are going to be here. Mm -hmm. Now, fortunately, the court didn't pronounce finally, but the court could have. If the court had done that, would you turn out and you, will you turn out and say that the organizers were criminals? No, they made a mistake. Somebody who gave them license made a mistake. It doesn't mean that there's criminality automatically. My book has tried to say that doing something which is legally wrong and therefore unsustainable does not automatically make it criminally liable. Mm. I take a decision, it's wrong, court reverses it. Hundreds of decisions are reversed every day. But the mere fact that my decision is reversed, sometimes even when the court feels it's a perverse decision, doesn't automatically mean culpability. What happened with 2G and what happened against us in many cases were what was seen as a wrong decision was treated automatically as also a criminal culpability issue. That's what I think was wrong for our country. But there are larger questions of political morality. And while courts will decide on legal or criminal culpability, uh, perception among voters is formed often on the basis of, of, of perceptions of political morality. Absolutely. Yeah? And, and therefore, I put it to you that that was where the question marks arose. That is where the media asked the questions. And I further put it to you that in a media-driven age of politics, the Congress was and remains woefully out of sync with the need to communicate. I, I, I would agree. I, I think that our biggest problem was not wrong decisions. Our biggest problem was our incapacity or inability or, or, or the lack of inclination to communicate. I think there was a change taking place in this country on the communication channels. Yeah. We failed in communication. 
which is why I said we need to communicate, we need to have a dialogue, we need to have a conversation. And therefore it's important that books get written, therefore it's important that we go out and meet with people, therefore it's important that we make ourselves av available for inquisitions, for questions, for questions and answers, and we are trying to do that. We are trying to do that. And you can't go to the first meeting and think that everybody will stand up and give you a standing ovation. But you know, you write about trying to tell Manmohan Singh yeah. to talk more to the media. You don't actually tell us whether you ever try to tell Sonia Gandhi or Rahul Gandhi the same. And a lot of people would feel that when politicians choose not to communicate, there is an, a subliminal arrogance in that position. Because what it comes across as is it's a one-way street I don't need to hear you. I don't need to take your questions. You know, I, I exist despite you and I will flourish despite you. There is an arrogance in the, in the non-communication. Well, I, I, I see in a non-communication, you could be like Peter O'Toole. Um, you, could, you can be the method system. Um, you communicate with your silences, etc. But in modern what was Manmohan Singh, in uh, modern what was Dr. Manmohan Singh communicating with his silences? Listen, I, I, have, said, I have said this, but give it a little time, give it a little time, and you will all be crying for Dr. Manmohan Singh's silences. Somebody said Dr. Manmohan Singh didn't speak, and there is somebody else who doesn't stop speaking. This is the difference. This is the difference. But I agree that in modern politics, modern politics, ability to speak, to communicate, is an essential part of politics and an essential part of governance, I agree. Therefore, the politicians of tomorrow, the politicians of times to come, will have to train themselves to communicate more extensively, which is where the media comes in. And perhaps if we communicate better with the media, media will not, not come to the conclusion that it has. Okay, um, I'm, uh, since we're short on time, I will open up for questions in a moment. But I want to ask you, you wrote this book to tell the Congress's perspective. You also believe history will be more generous to you than we in the media were. But what do you look back at as your biggest mistake, aside of the communication, which we've already addressed, what for you was that inflection point that you believe had you and your party handled it differently, the outcome may have been different? <laughs> well, I, um, I think there are, there are structure issues within the Congress that we are now not trying to deal with which uh, uh, did not allow us, did not allow us to, 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 uh, to let the, uh, the, the structure of coalition governments mature into something, something rewarding for the Congress. I think there were some inherent contradictions in the manner in which we had worked and which we were structured, um, uh, of unable, which didn't enable us to deal with coalitions properly. We were a coalition government that was functioning like a Congress government. And mm. I think that's, that's where we went wrong. Coalitions are going to be a problem for people to come in the future as well. There is a, there are a problem already with parties that are in coalition today in the country. And we have to understand in this country what coalitions are about. The Congress in inception was a coalition of different forces and different thoughts that came together in what's called a rainbow coalition. Mm. But Congress couldn't add to that rainbow by reaching out to people that were outside the rainbow. And I think that's what we need to work on. Let, 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 let me ask you quickly, do you not think that one of the biggest crises for the Congress is that its top job continues to be inherited at a time when almost all the other politicians around you, from Narendra Modi to Nitish Kumar to Arvind Kejriwal, are self-made people. Whatever else you may or may not like about them, they are self-made, their power is not inherited. And Rahul Gandhi can't talk up talk about democratization when the inheritance of power in fact represents entitlement. Well, I just see one thing in, in uh, and I, I, I think people, people need to know this. Uh, I, need, I need to say two things. One, how very honestly, whether you believe it now or not, but very honestly, Rahul Gandhi does want the Congress to be democratized in many ways. In but many is, he, ways. is he willing to step aside but for somebody better to lead the question, party? That's a question that you must ask him. But, but what I'm do you think? You, no, no, could I, you ever lead the Congress think, party? Could Chidambaram ever lead the Congress party? Could Digvijay Singh ever lead no, the Congress party? Could Jyotir Aditya Sindhya ever lead the Congress many, party? Could Sachin Pilot yeah, ever lead yeah, sure, the Congress sure, party? Sure, many of, us, many of us have attributes that are promising. But many of us has, have limitations. We don't have the ability to turn crowds the way 
our top leadership has turned crowds in the past. Now, it's for, but I just want to tell you sincerely, and this is not a psychophantic uh, plane, this is just to tell you sincerely what I've seen of our young leader, Rahul Gandhi, that he generally and genuinely wants to democratize the entire Congress process. And there may be people in the Congress who are not very happy with it, but he just, he's just genuinely want to do it. Given that he wants to do it in circumstances where even the self-made people are creating new dynasties in this country are something that you need to reflect upon. There is nothing in this country where there are no dynasties. Media, Bollywood, sports, politics, judiciary, nowhere, nowhere where there is no, there is no dynasties. It would be the wonderful, the best thing, best thing, I'm not quite sure about authors, perhaps even <laughs> in authors that's beginning to happen, but uh, the best thing that will happen in this country that we have greater social mobility and that politicians after serving one generation opt out and become authors and write books and, uh, and are more successful. I, get back, I got back after I lost my election, I got back to law, I had no lawyer in my family, so I would say I'm a self-made lawyer, but there are lawyers that I'm competing with who are third, fourth generation lawyers. Now, what do we do about that? You can't say that I will not compete with a four-generation lawyer. If their clients are willing to give them cases and not give them mm. to me, well, just too bad. If, if the voter is prepared to vote for somebody and not vote for me, well, just too bad for me. Okay, let's take a few questions. I will call out. Please only speak when I uh, call out to you. Yes, the gentleman here in the fifth row. Fifth row, yes. Please keep your questions brief. I have only three minutes for questions. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to ask you: uh, Does anyone in the Congress himself feels to take over as the chairman, as the head of the party, as, 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 as head the head of, of the party in place of the Gandhi family? So let me ask you a supplementary here. Sharad Pawar, in his book, said that he believes that he was never forgiven for wanting to lead the Congress party, and he was thrown out for that reason. How is that democratic? Well, I mean, it's, it was democratic in the extent, to, the, to the extent that Sharad Pawar came back and said, I've made a mistake, I want to join you again. He came back and he said so. Now, and the other thing that Sharad Pawar did is that he said, now I want to move on to Raj Sabha and I'll let, I'll let my daughter get elected. And she did get elected <laughs> and she's an outstanding young, young MP. And I think we can't simply disqualify her because her father happened to be representing the same constituency. So when India changes, all this will change. But till India doesn't change, what are you going to do? Just opt out. Okay, here in the second row. Second row, yellow jacket, yes. Well, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Salman Kushit says that he's listening and they are not stupid, the Congress party. But, and he says that he's in conversation with the Indian audience. I don't believe he's in a conversation with us. I mean, if, if there is a conversation, it's certainly one-sided. You know, it, a conversation has to be reflective, right? Like, you know, there's a hell of a lot of people here who don't disagree with the top leadership and they're not reflecting on it. Like, you know, he has to reflect on what it. What would you like, him, like the Congress to do differently? I mean, you exactly said that, you know, they stand everything, you know, uh, against empowerment. You know, he stands for entitlement. And how could he ever be, you know, like, you know, that could never be a, a PR strategy for him. Like, okay. he's been the biggest uh, disaster in the PR industry in this decade. Okay, let Mr. Kushi respond. It, the, it, he's saying it's a one-way conversation and that Mr. Gandhi represents a, 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 a kind of political royalty that today's India or today's young... You know, isn't it strange for you that young people, and th that worked for Modi, and in fact, you write that in the book, that a lot of people who voted for him, they were not coming from a Hindutva men, uh, bent of mind. They were probably looking for someone who was decisive, who was assertive, who was forceful. And despite Rahul being the young guy, the young of India did not relate to Rahul. Well, there are a lot of, lot of outstanding cricketers I know who never played test cricket. <laughs> it's uh, it's, it's something, that, something that nature decides for you. Now, the point, uh, the point that you are making is that this is not a two-way conversation is not correct. Because I'm not giving you a final judgment of the Congress party here. We are listening. I didn't have to come here. My book might have sold, not sold, but I've come here because I believe other than saying something in my book, I must listen to you. And if I listen to you and I take back to my party what you have said, how you've responded, how you've reacted, perhaps my party will be better informed and better equipped to respond to your future preferences. 
but don't treat this as a one-way conversation. There will not be a one-way conversation, I can assure you. We want a two-way conversation, and I don't want to run down people who have one-way one -way conversations, but we do want, and I honestly tell you, we want two-way conversations. Okay, this young girl here in the orange, yeah. Hello, sir. My question is, don't you think that Congress party is uh, now only and only for Sonia Gandhi and Rahul Gandhi's party, not for India's party? Because as we have seen in Lok Sabha, that uh, National Herald case, it was the personal case of Sonia Gandhi and Rahul Gandhi. Not for, not of Congress party, but Congress party leaders protest against uh, this case in Lok Sabha. So let me, let me, you know, a lot of people said that the moment you put 70% plus equity in the Gandhi's name, you were actually sending out the message in that, that the Gandhi's equals the Congress. Even if it was the Congress money and you were keeping it within the party, why 76% with Sonia and Rahul? Listen, if you have a, if you have a non-profit, non-profit body, somebody has to be on it. Now, would it be right for me to ask that uh, the Jaipur Literary Festival is owned only by three people, whereas all of you come here and contribute in your own way. <laughs> Somebody has to own it. Somebody has to, but they must be answerable to you. National Herald, please understand, National Herald is a non-profit body. It does not, and to the extent that there was any doubt about it, in, in Lucknow they voted and made it a non-profit body. So whether you have 100% or you have 200%, you don't get a penny out of it. You don't get a penny out of it. Once again, you may think whatever is happening in National Herald is wrong. You may be right in saying so. But whatever is happening in National Herald may be wrong politically in terms of, in terms of morality, in terms of your, your idea of how people should conduct themselves. But does that amount to a criminal offense? Yeah. That's what I've said in my book. Rights and wrongs. Yes, yes, yes. No, no. I'm sorry. No, no. If that was the case, if that was the case, your sitting here would be a criminal offense. Because <laughs> you're, you're okay. sitting here despite the fact that the judge thinks that you should not be sitting here. That's not the way this country is going to work. You cannot impose criminal offenses unless there is something called mens rea. If I say you are a murderer, you don't become a murderer. There must be a dead body and there must be some evidence to show that that dead body was caused by you. Otherwise, you can't have a criminal offense. But even cursing somebody or being rude to somebody, you might think is a wrong thing. And of course, you can say this is wrong. Okay. There's no problem. Okay, now we're out of time. So let me just ask a very brief last question. You know, you said the Congress represents a, a, an ideology. The problem is that the one uh, point of separation that you've taken for yourself vis-a-vis -vis the BJP is secularism. But many people look at the Congress record and they look at, for example, Shah Banu. They look at Rajiv Gandhi opening the locks at the Babri Masjid and allowing the Shilanyas to begin with. They look at communal riots that have, that have taken place on the watch of the Congress. They look at a Narendra Dabolkar being assassinated on the watch of the Congress government in Maharashtra. And they say, where is the authenticity in the claim to that secularism? So just a quick See, last answer to that. I would answer that. I'm not saying that we have an unblemished record and that we've always been correct. But where does the responsibility rest is for us, for you, and for the legal system to decide from time to time. And if we don't perform well, we get voted out. If somebody else doesn't perform well, they must also be voted out. Is the only thing that you have to decide in a democracy. We at least aspire imperfect, imperfectly, we aspire to secularism, and I will redefine secularism in a moment. But there are other people who do not even aspire to secularism. So you want to choose between those who don't aspire to secularism and those who imperfectly aspire. Secularism now has become a very, very misunderstood word. I would request you to use the word which I have suggested in my book, liberalism, not secularism. Secularism is only a small part of liberalism and liberalism is when you agree that the other person has a right to be wrong. You must accept the other person's right to be wrong. You can't simply say, I accept that you have a right to be right. You must have a right to be wrong. Only then you are a liberal. Only then you are a liberal society. Please help us work towards a liberal society where India and more of India looks like the Jaipur Literary Festival rather than the Jaipur Literary Festival look like what is outside and what almost happened to you three years ago, what was outside Jaip the Jaipur Literary Festival. 
All right, we leave it there. Lots of questions on what happened three years ago with Rajdi and the rest of it, and the book that got banned uh, many years ago on a Congress government's watch. Salman, may I remind you? But I am glad you have stood up let for me just tell you, Let me just <laughs> tell you one thing. Let me just tell you one thing because Mr. Chidamaram has commented on this. Ra Salman Rajdi's book was not banned in this country. Only import of that of that book was restricted. But be that as it may, the be that as it may. This is the country in which Ladies Chatterley's Lover remains an obscene book by a Supreme Court judgment. Yeah. Change the country, change the law, and we will all be much happier. Well, thank you for at least starting the conversation. We hope more people in your party are willing to take these questions. Let's have a round of applause for Salman Khurshid there. Thank you.